Welcome everyone to this event organized by the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation to celebrate 50 years uh, since the publication of Misner, Thorne and Wheeler. Uh, we're going to have uh, David Kaiser with us as well as uh, Kip Thorne and Charlie Misner. I'm going to give a brief introduction um, David Kaiser is a Germes House and Professor of the History of Science and Professor of Physics at MIT. He completed an AB in Physics at Dartmouth College and a, a PhD in Physics and the History of Science at Harvard. Um, he does research on the history of physics that focuses on the development of physics in the United States during the Cold War. His physics research focuses on early universe cosmology, working at the interface of particle physics and gravitation. And he has also helped to design and conduct experiments to test the foundations of quantum theory. Um, he has authored several award-winning books, including Drawing Theories Apart, The Dispersion of Feynman Diagrams in Post-War Physics, How the Hippies Saved Physics, which was named Book of the Year by Physics World Magazine, and Quantum Legacies, Dispatches from an Uncertain World, most recently in 2020. He received many honors, including um, being named a Fellow of the American Physical Society, and he was named a McBaker Faculty Fellow, which is MIT's highest honor for excellence in undergraduate teaching, as well as the Frankie Perkins Award for Excellence in Mentoring Graduate Students. David will give a brief introduction to MTW because he was, among many other accomplishments, also the author of the preface for the 2017 reprint of the book. Um, then we will have a, a talk by Kip. Um, I don't think he needs much of an introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Kip received his BS degree from the California Institute of Technology in 1962 and a PhD from Princeton in 1965, where his advisor was John Wheeler. And he returned to Caltech as an associate professor in 1967, where he became a professor in theoretical physics in 1970. Uh, he was one of the youngest full professors in the history of Caltech at age 30. Uh, he became William Arkin and junior professor in 1981 and the Feynman professor of theoretical physics in 1991. In uh, June 2009, he resigned from uh, that position to pursue a career in writing and movie making, uh, as we all know. Um, and uh, about 50 physicists have received PhDs at Caltech under his mentorship. He received so many honors that if I had to read them all, we would be here for a while. Uh, I would like to uh, mention the Albert Einstein Medal, the Shaw Prize, the Kabli Prize, and most recently also the Nobel Prize in Physics together with Ray Weiss and Barry Barish for decisive contributions to LIGO and the observation of gravitational waves. Uh, and after Kip's talk, we will have some remarks by Charles Misner. Um, Charlie received his BS degree from the University of Notre Dame in 1952. Then he moved to Princeton, where he completed his PhD in 1957 under John Wheeler. Before completing his PhD, he joined the faculty at Princeton with the rank of instructor, and then he was promoted to assistant professor there. In 1963, he moved to the University of Maryland College Park, where he became an associate professor and then a full professor in 1966. Uh, since 2000, he has been professor emeritus of physics at the uh, University of Maryland. He advised 22 PhD students. He was one of the first to point out the horizon problem in cosmology, and together with Arno Witt and Stanley Desert, he uh, developed the ADM formalism, uh, which splits Einstein's equations into space and time. In 2015, uh, he received the Albert Einstein Medal together with Stan Desert for, for their work. That's all I would like to say, and now I would like to uh, let David give a little introduction to MTW, and uh, thank you all for coming and joining us. Great. Well, well thanks very much. It's, it's really a great, great honor uh, to join you all uh, on this very fun and, and special occasion. So I'm going to just have a few remarks to help uh, frame the work that I think all of us know already so well. Uh, and I'm going to do so with, with a couple of slides. I'm going to jump in and share screen here. 
And so hopefully that first slide is now uh, visible for folks uh, on the Zoom. Okay, great. So as you know, we're here to, to mark and really celebrate uh, a 50 year anniversary of this really remarkable artifact. I have one of my copies with me already here uh, physically as well, let alone on screen. This book by uh, Mr. Thorne and Wheeler called Simply Gravitation. So I wanna start by placing uh, the book, not just in, in a 50 year context, really go back uh, the, uh, about a century, a little over a century, in fact, uh, to the earliest days of the general theory of relativity. And I think much of this will be familiar uh, for, for folks joining this call, but nonetheless, I think it's helpful to take an even longer step back. And so, as we know, Albert Einstein arrived at a form of the field equations for general relativity in a form that we would recognize and still often use today, very late in November, 1915. It turns out in the midst of the First World War, quite a dramatic time generally. And then in really quite rapid order, uh, the theory rose to worldwide prominence uh, four years later in uh, mid to late November uh, 1919, when uh, Arthur Eddington rose uh, to the podium in London to announce with great fanfare that a British expedition had measured the bending of starlight during an eclipse, uh, and that the measurements were consistent with predictions from Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, and it was this announcement just one year after the end of hostilities in the First World War that really catapulted both Einstein and the general theory of relativity to really worldwide celebrity status. So when Einstein traveled for his first visit to the United States not long after that, he was greeted with these kinds of parades through the streets of New York. I believe it was this visit or one soon after when he met the famous movie star Charlie Chaplin. It's when, when Einstein and gravitation, Einstein's work in gravitation, really became a kind of worldwide sensation uh, just uh, roughly 100 years ago. However, that early excitement was not really to last. It, it, the field entered what the astronomer and historian of physics, uh, Jean Eisenstadt, has, uh, has called the low water mark of relativity, that for the roughly 20 to 25 years after that very early excitement, the theory did not really flourish. There was a kind of stasis in the literature for all kinds of reasons that we can talk about, such that in 1942, when Einstein wrote a brief preface for the textbook by his friend and, and former student, uh, Peter Bergman, Einstein really lamented, saying, I believe that more time and effort might well be devoted to the systematic teaching of the theory of relativity than is usual at present at most universities. And he was right, it really had fallen out of view. And as other historians have, have documented, even for the decade or so, almost two decades, even after that moment, the theory still was not really kind of taking off in a way that we might expect given what we know now. And so work that I've done and other historians, Alexander Bloom and many others, have been trying to document this sort of shift in, in, um, in attention paid to general relativity. And we found, and others have found, that throughout even the end of the 1950s, quite a bit late, uh, most physics programs in the United States and comparable uh, developments elsewhere, neither required nor even recommended coursework on general relativity for their PhD students, with some clear exceptions we'll hear about. But the general pattern still by the end of the 1950s was that GR was simply not kind of in the mainstream, at least in many um, departments of physics. Uh, if courses were offered, there weren't questions asked on students qualifying exams for the PhDs and so on. This was really a kind of, a, as, as Ajahn Sadek called it, a low water. And yet we know, of course, something quite dramatic began to change really in the mid 1950s, a phase that's still often called the Renaissance of relativity. As a, a remarkable literature, such as a small sample on the bottom of my slides, some of the books that I find very helpful and I keep going back to myself, books by a number of physicists, by historians and philosophers of science. And it's still a subject of, of really uh, intense study uh, by historians uh, of science and, and physicists. How did this turn around? What might've spurred the turnaround when we see a dramatic change uh, an inflection like this starting in the mid fifties? And a couple of things just briefly to note about the timing of that turnaround. So as many of you uh, may know, the years after the end of the Second World War, after 1945, roughly anything we might choose to count about physics was growing exponentially. So seeing an exponentially rising curve in itself might not be so noteworthy until we dig in a little, a little bit more closely. Turns out this rate of growth in the publication rate worldwide as tracked in places like physics abstracts, this rate of growth on the study of general relativity outstripped the, the general exponential growth 
across the field uh, overall. So everything was growing exponentially. This has a higher exponent, and we know that can really lead to, to a dramatic change uh, in effect. So even in a time of general growth, the study of general relativity in the years after the end of the Second World War was growing at an unusual rate, even during a time of overall growth. That's number one. Number two, I just want to mention briefly, we really can't pin this inflection point on sort of new data or new discoveries alone. The timing doesn't quite work. So we see this incredible rise starting, say, in the mid-1950s, and that's before some of these remarkable ex new experiments and new astronomical discoveries had further accelerated uh, the field. So the Pound-Rebka experiment on gravitational redshift was published in 1959. That's a bit late to explain this part of the curve. The Shapiro time uh, delay was articulated a bit later and first conducted empirically by the mid to late 1960s. These are all downstream from this remarkable spike from the onset of what we've now called the Renaissance. Likewise, for dramatic astrophysical discoveries, quasars in 1963, the first detection of the cosmic microwave background, those are all in the future of this remarkable curve. And so instead of uh, thinking this, this uh, shift in the fortunes of gravitation were driven first and foremost by experimental data, by exciting discoveries, I think we have to switch the order here and wonder about how was it that a kind of critical mass, a community of non-zero size had already begun to coalesce and form to appreciate and, and, and make further work from these exciting discoveries that were soon to arrive. So that's why when I wear my historian's cap, uh, like many of my colleagues, I get really interested in, in questions about institutions, about networks, about influential teachers and mentors, like for example, John Wheeler. And so that's just something about the timing of this Renaissance, that it was a remarkable change of fortunes. Uh, and that's a kind of backdrop for the book that we're here to, to celebrate and, and talk about today. So let me talk just a little bit about MTW. And then of course, I wanna uh, hear like the rest of you uh, from, from uh, two of its authors. So the book was underway, under, uh, under prepar in preparation for a few years. It was published in the autumn of 1973, but of course it's a massive, massive book as we know, and it went through many iterations of drafts to get there. Here are some handwritten notes in John Wheeler's archives that are deposited at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. The group, had, the trio had already prepared a, a one or maybe more than one rough draft of things like the preface, and here are Wheeler's notes to his co-authors saying the first preface was okay, we can do better. And in particular, he wants the book to advance the idea of uh, we should all be studying gravitation, as he says, but soberly, factually, no hyperbole, no enthusiasm, which is what Wheeler was, I think, incapable of actually uh, doing. He was so full of hyperbole in a good way and enthusiasm. Nonetheless, he says, we should write it in a way that we're gonna convince the committee uh, planning graduate courses at, at an arbitrary university. We want this to be a textbook aimed for graduate students in physics. And of course, the very opening sentence of this marvelous book, when it did uh, come out in 1973, pronounces this is a textbook on gravitation physics. I underscore that because we'll see that that was not so obvious to all the people involved, uh, even though it seemed obvious enough to the authors. As we all know, the book's organized in a really quite remarkable way with these two tracks. The tracks, of course, are not sequential. There's a kind of interweaving of track one and track two material throughout many chapters. That's why the book has these marginal notes, these so-called dependency uh, statements that kind of map. The part you're about to read builds on this and we'll use it there because the book has this remarkable looping or nonlinear structure. Famously, of course, it has these beautiful boxes, many, many, many throughout the long book. And even in this sort of ordinary exposition, it's just chock full of these kinds of remarkable, uh, and many of them now iconic diagrams, very, very, very carefully constructed uh, black and white illustrations throughout the whole book. Here's a letter that Kip Thorne had written to one of their editors at the time early in the stage uh, of the production. I think Kip, this is one of the understatements of the decade when you wrote, several features of the manuscript will require special typesetting problems. That seems to have been very much true. As we know from the published version is beautifully lovingly constructed book, they were anticipating needing to use at least six and perhaps as many as eight distinct typefaces to just capture all the things they wanted to be able to convey. And just before the English edition first came out, Kip was advising colleagues like Seldovich and Novikov 
to be very careful when it came to foreign language translations, that not, no one should try to retype set the whole book because they'll never get the equations right, at least not to the degree that was so carefully done in the first edition. And so again, as Kip wrote, the extreme complexity of the typography is gonna make it very difficult to handle translations. And the original advice was simply to photograph the original version when it comes out in English and just paste those in for other languages because it was such a bear to put together. And so given all that, that the team was, had the ambition from the start to write a textbook for grad students in physics, uh, they were gearing up to share it with other colleagues to use for classroom use as well. Imagine the shock uh, when, when Kip Thorne spoke with one of their editors at the publisher and then reported back to, to uh, his co-authors this letter from February, 1972. Kip wrote, as you can see, I was rather shocked, he says, to learn from Bruce Armbruster, the editor at the press, that the people at the original publisher, W.H. Freeman, are so out of touch with our book, they've not been regarding it as a textbook at all, but rather as a technical monograph. I suppose the enormous size of the book has something to do with it. Freeman, that is to say that Freeman, the publisher, had not been expecting to pick up the textbook market with his book at all. Rather, the publisher thought it was a reference book or, or a research monograph to be produced only in very expensive hardcover form and then sold really only to libraries rather than being used uh, for classroom use. So that set off a, a new frenzy of correspondence. Much of the paperwork survives in, in Kip's files, in John Wheeler's files. And so there was a, a new round of, of negotiations with the publisher over pricing, over royalty rates and so on. The upshot was that the publisher agreed to produce a sturdy paperback, which stand up to classroom use. And if they did that, they can price the paperback in a way that would hopefully still be in, in range or in reach for a student market. So it was a very clever uh, calculation. They priced it just under the price of the hardcover edition of uh, Steven Weinberg's book, Gravitation and Cosmology, which had just come out uh, the previous year. So the paperback of MTW would still be uh, competitive price-wise with the hardcover of Weinberg's new book and therefore hopefully have access to the student market. So not long after that, once the book uh, did come into print, it was greeted by reviewers in the way that the authors uh, likely intended. It was seen as a textbook to be used for formal courses, especially for advanced students, for example, PhD students. It was widely heralded and celebrated right in the beginning. It's announced to be a masterpiece, one of the great books of science. But we also start to see a few notes of concern or confusion in the early reviews as well, which I think makes some sense given the unusual format of the book. So we see, for example, in one review, this is a difficult book to read in a linear progressive fashion. The two tracks certainly make that clear. There's a commendable attempt at informality, said the reviewer, but this reviewer at least found the breeziness irritating at times, questions about tone. The cosmologist McCrae went a bit further saying the variety of gimmicks is bewildering, framed headings with quotations, marginal titles, boxes sometimes extending over several pages, heavy type, light type, large type, small type, there's the six typefaces again. Clearly the book is an experiment in presentation on a grand scale. I think that's true as well. And finally, we get some puffy reviews like this one in New Scientist, who uh, the reviewer was so surprised and sort of turned off by the tone uh, that some considered poetical or lyrical and others considered a bit too informal, that this reviewer said, the people who would like this book are the people who are otherwise subscribed to Time Magazine because the writing is equally breathless. Okay, nonetheless, these reviewers treated the book as a textbook to be used for student teaching in a classroom. And therefore I find it remarkable when we come to re uh, reactions like this one in the Washington Post by the physicist David Park. This was now a major, major newspaper which was uh, chock full of coverage of, of, for example, the Watergate break-in and the foibles of the Nixon administration. In the midst of all that, they run a, a very lengthy review of this remarkable book. And the reviewer, David Park, pauses to say, Perhaps it's strange to review here in this kind of newspaper, a textbook full of mathematics, a book moreover, whose enormous weight, the uh, young, the old and the infirm can scarcely lift. But those who read like to know it's being published and discussed. This was a worthy book of broader attention and certainly according to David Park, not merely a textbook to aim straight to students. Park goes on in a passage I, I really love, Imagine that three highly inventive people get together to invent a scientific book, 
not just to write it, but really to invent it, to invent the tone, the style, the methods of exposition, and the format. This was indeed a, a real grand experiment. And Park goes on to say that the, the prose awakens hope that the fuzzy and lugubrious style that still spreads its gloom over so much of American science may not be in fashion forever. He says the kind of looping two-track style is exactly as interesting as the French uh, um, uh, traditions of new wave cinema, uh, that view stories, as he says, should be told sequentially. So here's an engagement with the book well beyond the kind of formal reviews or classroom use. And it was responses like this that convinced the original publisher a few years later to actually start advertising a discount for the book to people who subscribe to the popular magazine Scientific American is a remarkable reversal. A publisher that before the book came out thought that this wouldn't even be useful in the classroom. It would just go to libraries. Within a few years has turned around and is selling discounted copies uh, to non-scientists and people who aren't necessarily enrolled uh, in advanced courses. And they weren't wrong. And so here's another remarkable letter that was uh, in, in Kip's files that he generously shared with me many years ago from a reader who was not in, in physics but nonetheless had come across the book and wrote, I found a very poignant, very touching letter uh, back to Kip. So here's what, what a reader from outside Portland, Oregon said in 1980. He says, I stumble here, I fall down there and generally make a fool of myself as I wander around your textbook, but I'm gaining a sense of balance and a few tools with which to deal with the subject. And this next part, again, I think really uh, is so charming. When friends ask me what I'm doing, I have made the mistake of telling them the truth that I'm trying to read this, this big book. Sometimes I think they're right. I feel as though I'm on the brink of madness. I go out to have a beer and listen to someone talk about his love affairs, the clutch of his pickup truck, the problems with the children, the plumbing, the bus service. I look at him and see him dealing with all these important issues. And I ask myself, why do I care if I ever understand the difference between leptons and leprosy? And yet as he continues near the end of his letter, this reader, like many, many others, had become obsessed with what he considered to be Einstein's own question. And he writes, closing his letter, he really still wanted to know whether or not God had any choice in the creation of the universe. Could God be a traveling technician whose responsibility is to supervise gravitational collapses and big bangs? So here's a way in which the book was re resonating with readers far beyond uh, the formal classroom settings. And John Wheeler appreciated that too. Here's a letter he wrote uh, back to uh, uh, the, the new editor they were working with at the press uh, a few years after the original publication. And he agreed that many people were rushing to this book who were attracted, as he wrote, by the mystique, by the boxes, by the interesting illustrations, by the ideas, but who don't expect to and never will get deep into the mathematics. And there was a thought the authors might consider a revision of the book, a, a kind of revised edition. And he didn't want to lose that group that in thinking about a next edition of MTW, let's keep this kind of reader in mind, not to the exclusion of the advanced physics students, but not to lose them either. And so since its original publication 50 years ago, this marvelous book has been really a fascinating and certainly to me and many others, an inspiring hybrid. It's part research monograph or reference work. It's certainly still clearly a textbook. And yet it's had this resonance as a broader kind of crossover or popular book as well, all uh, in, in wrapped up in, in merely 1,279 pages. So I'm gonna pause here. I wanna congratulate both Professor Misner and Professor Thorne for the first 50 years. And here's looking forward to the next 50 uh, now that this lovely new edition is available from Princeton University Press. Thanks. Thank you so much, David, for this wonderful introduction. I think we can let Kip share his slides and his presentation at this point, and then we'll ask for questions. Hey, thank you very much, David. I really enjoyed your remarks. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here. Um, I'm not as facile with this as uh, David is. So, okay, I presume you can see that all right. Okay, so uh, the historical context in which uh, uh, this uh, we wrote this book has been laid out very beautifully by David. Uh, sorry, what's going on here? Okay. In the 1940s and 50s, by that time, general relativity had become largely an effort at exploring the subject mathematically because there really were no 
uh, interesting experiments uh, had come along aside from the very early ones. And uh, there were no applications to the, the universe aside from the Big Bang. In fact, Jesse Greenstein, who was my undergraduate advisor, I did research uh, with him. He was a wonderful astrophysicist. When I told him that I was going for graduate school to Princeton uh, to work with John Wheeler in relativity, he said, uh, Kip, I should caution you that uh, relativity is not really relevant, particularly to the universe, aside from the Big Bang, and we understand the Big Bang, and so you're probably wasting your time. And that was a general attitude of, of astrophysicists of that era. Uh, in 1954, of course, John Johnny Wheeler, uh, who had been working in nuclear physics through uh, his career until then, turned his attention to general relativity, and he participated in what David described so beautifully of uh, the uh, renaissance of relativity, injecting new viewpoints and a very physical approach into the subject. Uh, he had his, uh, one of his early students was Charlie Misner, a uh, PhD student of Johnny in 54. Uh, let me just remark that uh, I very carefully called uh, Professor Wheeler, Professor Wheeler until uh, the day after I uh, defended my PhD dissertation, I called uh, his home and spoke to his wife, Jeanette. I said, uh, I'd like to speak with Professor Wheeler, please. And she said, now, Kip, you just defended your dissertation. You can call him Johnny. And so <laughs> I, if I lapse into calling him Johnny or John, well, that's the way I thought about him from that day forward. So John's Charlie Misner was John's PhD student from 54 to 57 on the faculty that uh, Princeton 56 to 63. Notice he be became an, an instructor before he had even defended his PhD thesis, the year before he defended his PhD thesis. Uh, and then went to the University of Maryland as the professor. Uh, I was Johnny's student from 62 to 65 then one year of postdoc there, and then went to Caltech on the faculty. And so that's uh, where we were at that time. Uh, John at Princeton, Charlie at uh, Maryland, I at Caltech. Uh, when I was trying to learn relativity, I read uh, in very carefully Landau and Lifshitz's classical theory of fields. And I had the benefit of the Lee-Zeus lectures that John and others had given on relativity groups and topology. And I browsed uh, and read significant portions of books by Tolman, Bergman, John Singh, who also, like Johnny Wheeler, had a rather geometric view of uh, relativity, and Joe Weber. Well, these were the texts that influenced me early on. Uh, but there was great motivation for a new textbook, uh, John, Charlie, and I thought. There, first, there were new astrophysical and cosmological applications that had come along in, uh, uh, the, uh, in the years before we went into this. The quasars were discovered in 63, the cosmic microwave background in 64 and 65, pulsars in 1967. Uh, we felt it was rather strongly that general relativity should be tied to modern differential geometry a la carton a subject on which uh, Charlie was uh, very deep. Uh, we wanted a textbook that had a strong focus on physical interpretation of the subject, that uh, focused very heavily on building up physical intuition rather than focusing uh, primarily on the mathematics. And uh, we had become enamored, Charlie and I had become enamored under the uh, magnetic influence of uh, Johnny Wheeler enamored of the geometric interpretation of general relativity and had begun to think of physics as geometry. So these were four motivations that led us to think of writing a new textbook. Uh, so uh, just a second, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Okay. So uh, John and Charlie and I were then, I uh, went into a process of agreeing on writing a book and planning. Um, so in, in, sorry, in June 1967, uh, we were at a conference on uh, flu on fluids and uh, and relativistic gravity in Paris, France, and we walked along beside the sand, talking and discussing uh, should we embark on this 
Johnny strongly encouraged Charlie and me to write a book together. Charlie and I said, there's no way we can do it without you. And uh, so we pulled him into it as well. And uh, we made an informal agreement then in June 67, we would write this book. In November 67, we were together again in New York City uh, at a conference on supernovae. And we went to a Chinese restaurant and created what we call the Chinese Restaurant Treaty among the three of us. Uh, when two authors declare we are finished, we're finished. The background behind that was that John and, and uh, Barry Malik had written a remarkable textbook on nuclear physics that never got finished, that never got published because John was never willing to regard it as finished. And we didn't want him to go through that process. So we got this agreement uh, and we made an agreement. The book should be concise. We were afraid it might get really overly long. And so we did make an agreement. It should be concise, maybe, maybe even just 200 pages. Uh, and a few uh, months later, we were in John's uh, uh, home office, and a book uh, by, by Ernst Schmutzer on relativistic physics had just come out, and John pulled it out of his bookcase and uh, laid it down in front of us and said, look, let this be an inspiration to us, the size of a book not to write. It was 968 pages, somewhat less than MTW turned it out to be. Sadly, indeed, MT sadly question mark. MTW turned out to be 1279 pages, some uh, 300 pages longer than Ernst's book. Uh, we worked uh, uh, over the period from 1967 to 72 for five years on this book. It was a period of uh, intense change in general relativity and relativistic astrophysics. Was the period of compact X-ray sources, the black hole in Cygnus X1, black hole accretion disks, uh, evidence that quasars are powered by massive black holes, theorems on the uniqueness of black holes, the laws of black hole mechanics, global methods, singularity theorems, mixed master cosmology, BKL cosmology, cosmic censorship, black holes as dynamical objects, pulsating black holes, gravitational wave geometric optics, the energy momentum of gravitational waves, parameterized post-Newtonian approximation. All of these things uh, were done while we were writing. And all of these, of course, got incorporated into the book while we were writing. And uh, some of these things were done in our own research groups while we were writing uh, by our students largely, but not entirely, uh, because we were kind of busy writing. Uh, some remarks about the authors. So John, had a conservative politics and a conservative demeanor. I've uh, written about this to some degree in my book, Black, Black Holes and Time Warps. Uh, but he had a very colorful physics style, even flamboyant. Uh, he, uh, when he gave lectures in that era before view graphs and before PowerPoint and uh, keynote, he would put on the blackboard very colorful diagrams and uh, for the lecture, and then he would a lecture to those diagrams is shown here. This was a lecture on the occasion of the uh, 60th birthday of uh, Willie Fowler, whose bald head you see down there. Willie was a colleague of mine at Caltech. Uh, John had very deep physical intuition and he was willing to speculate on the basis of his physical intuition. And an uh, anecdote uh, that uh, I like to tell about this was when John and Richard Feynman and I went to the Burker Continental in Pasadena in 1971. Uh, John and I and Charlie were in the midst of writing uh, MTW. John was out to give a major lecture at Caltech, but also to spend a full week uh, with me on the writing of the book. So uh, Richard and John and I went to the Burger Continental. John started to hold forth on his new idea, new then, that uh, the laws of physics spring up, they're born in the Big Bang, along with all the matter and everything we see in the universe. The laws of physics are also born there. And that there is a huge range of possible laws of physics that could have been born. And there must be some sort of uh, super principle or super uh, laws of physics that govern which laws of physics arise from the Big Bang. Uh, Feynman turned to me as John was talking about this, and he said, this guy sounds crazy. What the people don't appreciate is he's always sounded crazy. But if you take some of his craziness like this and you unwrap the layers of craziness one after another after another, down in the heart of that, 
you will find often some very deep kernels of truth and you just have to go digging for them. Uh, and they might even give you a Nobel Prize, he said, referring, of course, to, uh, to Johnny's having told him, well, gee, a positron is an electron going backward in time. And uh, that's why all the electrons are the same. Uh, it's because they are, uh, electrons have gone forward and backward in time many, many times to have us seeing uh, the flipping back and forth is involving annihilation or pair creation. And that became the foundation for Feynman, uh, uh, triggered Feynman to start thinking about Feynman diagrams. So, so Feynman really had a deep appreciation for John's speculation. John's speculation about uh, the laws of physics being born in the Big Bang uh, really is basically a precursor to uh, the landscape of string theory today. Uh, but John was actually mathematically strong, and very, very few people appreciated this, but Feynman appreciated it. Uh, one uh, evening, he and I were a little inebriated at a party, just sitting off in a corner and chatting, and uh, Feynman, who always called John Professor Wheeler, he never called him Johnny. I think he never had that uh, little talk from, uh, from Jeanette. Uh, Feynman uh, said, you know, I still have some pain and angst when I think back when I was a graduate student and I was uh, talking with Johnny about uh, talking with Wheeler about uh, the calculation and I couldn't understand how he got from one step to another and he turned to me and he showed me step by step but as he did it he said little steps for little people now for those of you who knew Johnny would be absolutely flabbergasted, as was I, because John was unfailingly polite. But to Feynman on that occasion, and it's the only occasion I am aware of where he was absolutely impolite, but it's pretty obvious Feynman was full of himself as a graduate student, and, uh, and John felt presumably that he had to be put down, put in his place. And so John did it, and he did it to him by showing him that he could do mathematics uh, faster than, than Feynman could. Um, so Charlie Misner, Charlie was the mathematically the deepest of us uh, among the three of us. And that was a, a particular strength, a very important strength that he brought to this effort in order to tie our general relativity into the deep mathematics of differential geometry. Uh, he had already with Arnowet and Deser formulated the so-called ADM uh, formulation of general relativity, a three plus one uh, dimensional Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, which would become the foundation for numerical relativity uh, initially in his own hands and th that, that of, of, uh, uh, of colleagues in the 1950s, and then moving on, of course, through a long history of decades long history. Uh, this is a picture of, of uh, Arnewet on the left, Deser on the right, and Charlie in the center. Uh, Stan and Deser sadly passed away in, within the last few days. He was a real giant of physics. Uh, and in his later years, he spent a lot of uh, time at Caltech. And uh, it was such a pleasure to interact with him. Uh, me, what did I bring to this? Well, primarily, I was the one that was closest to astrophysics into experiment. So you had Johnny with his deep physical intuition, Charlie with his deep mathematics, me with the tight astrophysics and experiment. And it really was a remarkable mix. 67 to 68, uh, we uh, repair, were preparing to write the book. Misner and Wheeler were teaching courses at Merrill in, on relativity at Maryland and Princeton. I was off at the University of Chicago with Chandra Sakar, just doing research and interacting with Chandra, with whom I had become a close, close friends. Uh, and at Maryland, uh, Charlie had uh, graduate students take down lecture notes based on what he was saying. And uh, I have in my uh, uh, MTW files, I have this law, huge stack of lecture notes from Charlie from uh, the 67, 68 academic year. Johnny Wheeler himself wrote his own lecture notes by hand. Here are notes for Thursday, 7th of March, 1968. The physical components of the curvature tensor, tide producing force. He wrote these up and passed them out to the students. 
And again, I have a huge stack of these uh, in my files at home. Uh, in uh, December 1967, uh, I produced, uh, I, I was doing nothing on the book, but I thought I could at least produce a proposed outline for the book. So I produced a pro proposed outline for the 10 week course on the fundamentals of general relativity at the beginning. This was analogous to what would become track one. And then part two, a deeper, more detailed treatment of the most important special topics. Again, analogous to part two, but not integrated together at all like they ultimately would be in the, our book. Summer 68 to spring of 1969, we had many long discussions and a lot of planning. Uh, we, our actual level of work on the uh, book was rather low. We were deeply involved in our own research. We were basically just gearing up to, uh, for a big effort. Uh, we did write dra drafts of a few chapters and pieces of chapters, uh, and we thought through things and uh, realized we would want to reorganize things so that track one and track two were intermingled in the manner that they wound up. And I think it was during this period that we decided we wanted to have boxes because the subject is really quite nonlinear and boxes were a very good way to enable the reader to, to take advantage of the non-linearity non of the subject. So the reader could uh, go off in a tangent and uh, study boxes or not uh, and do it whenever the reader wished. Uh, in the summer of 1968 until the summer of 1970, we had an intense near 100% effort on the book. And this led to the first preliminary edition in September, 1970. And uh, we had an agreement in this era and uh, on until the book was finished that whenever two of us expected to be together, the third was obligated to try to join at least for a few days. So we met and we wrote and revised in among others at Princeton University at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, where we could go and hide uh, away from Johnny's uh, office at the university. At the University of Maryland at Caltech, at the University of Texas at Austin, in the National Airport in Washington, D.C., uh, when uh, one of us was going through, uh, Charlie would come out and we could meet there. Um, or, and we'd, uh, the three of us met there on more than one occasion. Dublin, Ireland, Kyoto, Japan, John and Charlie were there together. Uh, in the USSR, the three of us went to the USSR and we wrote uh, on the book in Moscow and Kiev and uh, Leningrad and in Maine. Maine was a particularly memorable place for me, summer 1970. Uh, the John had per and Jeanette had purchased half of High Island. It's at the northern end here. John and Jeanette had built a, a home here on High Island. Originally, they, ha they had a log cabin up here, and then they built a modern home down there. There was also a cottage over here on High Island where uh, I stayed on more than one occasion when I was out there to work on this book or other projects. Uh, just before this time, Charlie and Susanna had bought a home uh, down here about one kilometer distance from John and Jeanette, uh, looking out across the bay. There's a, a picture of uh, what they saw from their home. And so in the summer for two months, July and August 1970, uh, my wife, Linda, and I and our children went and we rented a, a little cottage down here on McFarland's uh, uh, Cove, uh, very near where Charlie was. And we had just an idyllic summer of very intense riding, but also with our families there. Here's Charlie and Johnny. There's uh, Susanna, uh, Charlie's wife, uh, the uh, four Misner children, Benedicta, uh, Francis, uh, Tim, and Chris, uh, and me, my wife, uh, Linda, our children, Karis and Brett. Uh, I don't have a photo of, of Jeanette from that summer, but I'm going to show you Jeanette at the end of the lecture, a lovely photo of Jeanette at the end of the lecture. Uh, so summer 19, uh, six, uh, from summer 1969 uh, to summer 1970, uh, we wrote very intensely. And for each chapter, one of us wrote a first draft. We then, that person then circulated it one after another to the other authors. And it went around the circle among the authors at least three times around. So 
So they were at nine revisions total at a minimum until it finally converged. In some cases, it took somewhat more than nine revisions in order to converge. Uh, we would send it out for typing whenever the manuscript got too messy to uh, really work with, uh, and then uh, start to work again from the typed version. So here is John's first draft of a chapter on orbits in the Schwarzschild metric, the pit in the potential, a typical John title for a chapter. Uh, here is John's typical first draft of a box. John's lovely hand-drawn uh, uh, diagrams of trucks that are carrying many tons of computer paper on which are written the distances between uh, various points, which can all be uh, absorbed into the metric, an explanation of the nature of a metric. And here are uh, the uh, list of the first point, second point, distance, uh, between them and so forth and so on. So he did these elaborate drawings, uh, so many of them all by hand, which then were converted in, into the drawings that you see in the book. But they, his original hand drawings are not much different from what you see in the final book. And he was just a master of this. Here is Charlie's uh, first draft of a chapter on gravitational waves. It's part seven of the book, chapter W. He didn't, he didn't know which chapter it was going to be. So his gravitational wave chapter, he did all the first drafts were chapter W, W plus one, W plus two, W plus three. My chapter, amazingly, I'm the one who wrote the first chapter on global techniques, horizons and singularity theorems. It didn't matter that it was me who understood this, perhaps the least of the uh, three of us. It didn't matter that, it was, that I was the one that wrote it because it got circulated around and, uh, revised about nine times or more before uh, the uh, book finally came out. Uh, here is an example of uh, a, a manuscript that we had been working on one after another as it went around. You see a piece of John's writing there, cut and paste, and then my writing, it's cut and pasted onto a piece of Charlie's writing. Uh, and this is the way page after page after page of cut and pasted like that. Uh, here is uh, some uh, rewriting, uh, uh, this is John down here rewriting a piece of Charlie's stuff, and here is uh, John rewriting a typescript, and he has a note here, yeah, this is ready to go out to the typist again, and that's how these went to the typist, uh, that's how we circulated among each other, no internet, it was air, air mail, and the, John's typical, uh, uh, very careful handwriting to make absolutely sure they know this has to go by airmail and not by ground. The first preliminary edition we came out with then in September 1970, uh, it had nine parts versus 10 in the final book, 33 chapters versus 44 in the final book. So it was very much like the final book, but the chapters were somewhat different. The parts were uh, somewhat different, but we were well on our way uh, by then. Summer 1970 to summer 1971, we continued to work intensely, extensive revisions. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we added uh, 11 chapters in one part, and the, the book was converging. We got together in Maine, Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, Maryland, Caltech, and Johnny and I by the sea in San Felipe, Mexico. Uh, but mostly we were working intensely uh, at uh, one institute, one of our institutions or the other. Second preliminary edition came out then finally in September 1970. Uh, this is, uh, these preliminary editions were all uh, uh, put together and printed at the University of Maryland, although this says the University of Utah, it's because uh, it, it, this is the copy that was at one time owned by the University of Utah but it was produced at uh, the University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, we were tremendously grateful to Charlie and uh, the team there that uh, did the production. We had the same nine parts as the final book, the same 44 chapters as the final book, but a few of the titles were a little different, but we were very close to finished, we thought. Um, when this uh, first came, when this came, edition came out, Bill Press, who was a student of mine, is shown here, me, Bill, and his wife, Margaret, uh, Saul Tikulski, and his wife, Roz, at, at dinner uh, together. Bill 
came in, he plunked uh, a copy of this preliminary edition down in front of me, uh, and he turned it to chapter 33 on black holes, where he had found a dialogue between Segretus and Salvatius uh, on what is all this talk about black holes, and then some argument about why that's a lousy name. Let us take this name black hole apart, says Salvatius, and some discussion here. Uh, and uh, he said, why did you ever let John Wheeler put something like this into this book? Uh, it had been patterned after Galileo's dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, quite obviously, though the names, the Greedus and Helvetius, were slightly changed so as not to totally plagiarize uh, Galileo. I told, uh, was, I told Bill with great glee, I wrote that in John's style. I'm responsible for that. And I did take uh, great pleasure in writing on occasion in John's style. In the meantime, Back in May 1971, we had chosen the publisher, W.H. Freeman and Company in San Francisco, which was owned by Scientific American. And we had negotiated a contract, which we signed on the 3rd of May, 1971. I took responsibility from the beginning uh, once we had signed a contract for uh, interactions with the publisher. Fall of 1971 to summer 1972. Well, the book was finished, but we really needed to do some final cleaning up of the manuscript and massaging. Uh, we wanted this book to really be as perfect as we possibly could. It really required a lot of final massaging and cleaning up. We added a dedication. Uh, and this is from a letter that John wrote uh, to the two of us in the 25th of January, 1972, in which he says, I would like to take up and expand on a theme that you sounded, Charlie, at the end of your chapter on the mixed master cosmology about the interest of the public in science. I must say I'm upset every time intellectuals set themselves up on pedestals as objects of worship rather than as servants of the larger public. In that vein, John proposed the following dedication. This book is dedicated to the humble old lady sweeping the walk with her broom the eager child and all who, with their love of truth, take from their own wants by taxes and gifts, and now and then send forth a dedicated servant out of their number to forward the search into the mysteries and marvelous simplicities of this strange and beautiful universe, our home. Quintessential Wheeler. But it was just a little bit too elaborate for John, for Charlie and me. And so, uh, Charlie, and I, this is a letter, John. Uh, and uh, it says, Charles and I would like to propose a little change in the dedication. And we asked him to remove the humble old lady sweeping the walk with her broom and the eager child. And simply the book is dedicated to all who with their love of truth and so forth. And so we did tone Johnny down from time to time. And Johnny uh, accepted this. Uh, I approve this change. He signs off on it. Uh, but in fact, we were pretty, in fact, ruthless about rewriting each other, pretty f open and frank. Uh, that was the only way we were, we were going to come up with a book that we thought was really, really good, was uh, not holding back and criticizing each other. But on the other hand, there was a lot of love among the three of us and uh, a lot of respect. And this sort of character epitomizes the kinds of things we were doing with, with John's when John got just a bit too elaborate for us. Fall 1971 to summer 1972, we massaged the manuscript, I said, we added the dedication, we added and checked references. John took responsibility for the references. He maintained the bibliography. He, he uh, was really a stickler for detail and he did a beautiful job of this. He just took it on himself. Uh, we all checked equations of the manuscript and searched for errata. Our goal was no errors in equations. If the readers find errors, they will quickly lose faith in us. And so we did a multiple checking of the equations. And I'm aware of only about 10 errors in the equations in the first printing of the entire book, an average of one error per 100 pages in that book, basically. And that, I think that's really, really amazing that, uh, that we did manage with help, however, to pull this off. Sorry, I... Uh, we each took responsibility for one third of the chapters and hired a student to help. 
uh, it was Carlton Caves, who I see is here today, uh, who helped me uh, with checking of equations. He was uh, very early, he was first or second year graduate student at, at that point. Uh, so here's the list of uh, equations of chapters that Charlie was responsible for, my chapters, John's chapters in checking the equations. Uh, and uh, we also had the help from many, many readers. We uh, had in our preliminary versions uh, requests for critical comments. Please tear this page out and uh, put in all the errata you can see in the critical comments. And so this is one reader who fought finding errors and making critical comments. Others just sent long letters of comments. Carl Caves, here is a rather thorough error list, Kip. And so for Carl uh, to take care of. February, 1972, uh, we got this great shot from the publishers that uh, David talked about. Freeman had not been expecting to pick up the textbook market with his book at all, but rather uh, to prepare an expensive hardcover edition for sale to libraries. We negotiated a reduction in royalties in return for which a paperback edition would be priced below or the same as Weinberg's book. And that was the written agreement between us. In fact, I think the written agreement may have said it would be priced below Weinberg's hard, hardcover book, as, as David said. The publisher did a market survey uh, after this, after we reached, reached this agreement. That market survey told the publisher they would have an estimated lifetime sales of 8,000 copies. And I was told this in extreme confidence. We, we were not supposed to know this, uh, but 8,000 copies was their estimate. Uh, the actual sales got to be considerably bigger than that. Uh, September 1972, another shock. I'm saying this from memory. I can't, was not able to quickly find paper documentation of it, but we were beginning to submit chapters for copy editing, and the, the, the publisher was working on details of how the production would be done. And uh, it was quite clear to the publisher that the production was going to be far more complex than they had anticipated. You had all these uh, uh, many different type fonts and uh, John's figures and uh, drawings and so forth and all the gimmicks. There was no way the publisher told us that the book could be out in time for classes in autumn 1973. Well, we were devastated. And so I flew to San Francisco and sat down with the, the people who were dealing with it, the publisher and discussed with the editorial and production staff. Uh, and uh, they said it's just impossible. But then a recently hired young woman who seemed to be quite competent, but there was a bit of an unknown, just quite recently hired, named Beth Eddy. She asserted in this meeting that if they would put her in charge of the production, she could make the deadline. <laughs> I put pressure on them. She said she can do it, let's do it. If, if, if we fail to make the deadline, well, it's no worse than uh, having somebody else fail to make the deadline, so let's do it. And so they did. She was given the job, she succeeded, made the deadline, and made a great reputation for herself. And after our book came out, she left Freeman for greener pastures. Beth's production schedule. Uh, we were getting galleys and we're checking the equations in the galleys once again, as well as all the details of the galleys from December 8th to March 12th. Uh, and this is then in 1973. Uh, page proofs, March 21. We had nine days to catch our breath. Page proofs, March 21 to June 4. Then I had uh, I, I had a matter of one week by which time I was had to turn an index in uh, to uh, Freeman to go to the compositor. Uh, I went to San Francisco for a period of about four days, maybe five days, and I indexed the book at the publisher in San Francisco. Uh, and just nonstop. And I'm amazed that it came out reasonably good, <laughs> given the sleepless nights and the intensity of, of the task. The book was published as promised uh, on September 14, 1973. Uh, the reaction of the book, David has talked about the reaction of the book. I'd like to fo uh, focus on one reaction, the reaction of Subramanian Chandrasekhar, a dear friend of mine. Uh, he wrote, 
a uh, review for physics today. And he sent it to me uh, at the time that he submitted to physics to review physics to physics today with this note, Kip, if you're disappointed with the review, you may take more take consolation in T. Huxley's remark, a man of science past 60 does more harm than good. Vintage Chandra. And he wound, he uh, finished his uh, review with this sentence. It was a long review. It wasn't scathing, but it wasn't positive by any means, uh, but it wasn't scathing. Uh, but there, he fin finished off with a sentence. There is one overriding impression this book leaves. It is written with the zeal of a missionary preaching to cannibals. This reviewer, probably for historical reasons, has always been allergic to missionaries. So I wrote back to Chandra. I said I thought his review was very fair. And the last paragraph of the review left me chuckling for about 10 minutes. In fact, this uh, review it was uh, indicative of the enormous differences in the style between Chandra and Johnny. Chandra's style in physics was mathematical. Uh, he rarely focused on physical intuition. He drew the physics out of the mathematics and he uh, did long complicated calculations. And he uh, even wrote a little book on Sorry, that's Carolyn. Just Carolyn, can you get that? Uh, Carolyn, it, 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 may, it may be a Zipply fiber. Excuse me, we've had our phone has been out for weeks and it's just come back on. Um, so the yeah, so so the differences in style between Chandra and Johnny. Chandra uh, even wrote a little book on uh, beauty in uh, in mathematics. He would take instead of he, he would do a long complicated calculations on a sheet of paper, and he would search for ways to make the mathematics look more beautiful. And that was a big piece of his process of making scientific discoveries. Absolutely, totally the opposite of John, who is capable of doing uh, complicated mathematics, though I think Chandra never knew he was capable of it. Uh, and John always uh, focused on the physical, on physical intuition. Uh, and uh, uh, Chandra uh, was conservative in his physics style, as well as, uh, but quite liberal mathematically. Uh, John was very conservative in his personal style, uh, uh, but uh, very wild. Uh, I'm sorry, conservative in his in his uh, personal style and his politics. Let me start over again. Chandra is politically liberal. John was politically conservative. Chandra uh, had a conservative physics style. That John had a wild physics style. They were just absolutely as opposite as, as you could imagine. And Chandra, who through his whole life suffered uh, a lot of uh, discrimination because of his dark skin, uh, usually subtle discrimination, but discrimination that was obvious to him. This was always, a, 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 I think, a, a driving factor among uh, uh, for him. And I think he even saw John's style as being something that is was more like the uh, British overseers of the of India, uh, that, where he had grown up, they there's just was this, this tension between them, particularly from Chandra toward Johnny. Johnny, uh, I think a little less so toward Chandra, but it was all buried very deep, and you had to know them extremely well in order to really see that. But this is at least is the way I saw saw it. Uh, I think that others, there are several other people here who may have known, probably knew Chandra better than I do and might disagree with me. But anyway, that is, uh, was my part of what I think was going on behind the scenes here. So uh, in uh, MTW became a sort of a cult book, as uh, David alluded to. I was told that the street people in Berkeley during the Vietnam War, the anti-war protesters and so forth, 
And some of them could be seen carrying MTW around. It was sort of a mark of, uh, of intellectual uh, self-importance that you carried a copy of MTW around. The, the University of Texas uh, Physics uh, Department used it as part of advertising that uh, you could should go over to the physics department, get coffee, uh, and uh, are the thoughts of the why keeping you up at night? Well, there's uh, a picture of gravitation there. MIT, uh, not to be uh, outdone, uh, put out a picture that I think is a little too much nudity for me to show on the screen, but also with, uh, with a copy of uh, gravitation covering up the nudity. And uh, so among, even among students at uh, the two institutions and elsewhere, it became a sort of a cult book. The demise of MTW. Freeman was purchased by Scientific American in 1964 before we signed with them. In 86, the Scientific American sold Freeman to the Holtzbrink Publishing Group. In 1999, Macmillan Publishers was also sold to Holtzbrink. And in 2007, Holtzbrink in the US changed its name to Macmillan. And after that, Freeman became an imprint of Macmillan. So it was basically a shadow of Macmillan. Macmillan was controlling it. In 2008, John died, a huge loss, a great shock for all of us. Around 2014, Macmillan classified MTW as chemistry and moved it into its chemistry catalog and it appears to have stopped marketing it on Amazon. Sales dropped precipitously, and in 2015, Macmillan took MTW out of print without notifying the authors. I got a few emails from people having trouble buying the book, and the next royalty statement from Macmillan showed zero sales in the US. Uh, after consulting with Charlie and with John Wheeler's children, Jamie, Letitia, and Allison, I arranged for Joan Winstein to negotiate with Macmillan. Joan uh, was the uh, widow of uh, of Bruce Winstein, my brother-in-law, uh, but she also was the book agent for her father, who had written. It was a a guru in, in management consulting, uh, and uh, she had dealt with Macmillan on similar matters to this, and so she took it over. A few days after LIGO announced discovery of gravitational waves, Joan began trying by emails and phone calls to get Macmillan to either put MTW back in print or he turned the rights to the authors. Macmillan showed no interest in doing either, despite pleadings that the discovery of gravitational waves would trigger increased sales. After two months of total inaction by Macmillan, Joan had an attorney write a letter demanding the return of rights to the authors on grounds that Macmillan had failed to put the book back in print or even say that they would do so. Macmillan, Macmillan quickly responded, return the rights to the book to us. With rights in hand, we explored republishing with Dover and Princeton University Press, and chose Princeton. Sales with Princeton in five years have been 25,000 copies, 5,000 copies a year on average. Macmillan screwed up. Uh, and for an ebook at a list price of $44, hard book at a list price of $60, which deflates to about $10 in 1973. So half the price of the original paperback is what you can buy it for. It's a pretty good deal. So. Lifetime sales have been about 110,000 copies compared to Freeman's market estimate of 8,000. So we did pretty good. I was going to say a few things about gimmicks, but I think I uh, want to bring it to the end with just uh, uh, John and Jeanette Wheeler in their later years on High Island and a quote that John liked uh, very, very much, uh, which could apply to our book. They apply equally well to John's speculations, they apply equally well to much of John's physics. It looks strange, and it looks strange, and it looks very strange, and then suddenly it does not look strange at all, and you cannot understand what made it look strange in the first place. Gertrude Stein. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kip. That was wonderful. I collected some comments that were made in the chat because I think we can use them to uh, ask you for verification or or kickstart. The so so may, maybe we could just have a few oh. words by Charlie first. Um, That's correct. Sorry. Yes. Um, my apologies. I forgot. I was <laughs> too taken with the chat. Well, thank you all. Uh, yes. 
space is talking to you. Okay, Charlie, Charlie, can you speak up loud, loudly? Okay, <clears throat> try to do that better. Is this clear? I hope. Is my voice coming through now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so thank you ever so much. That was a beautiful, well organized speech. I'm uh, glad you mentioned uh, uh, Ida and Besser because we do miss Besser very much. He was a great friend, a uh, wonderful person to have had interactions with. Of course, throughout all this work with you and uh, John, that was an amazing uh, series of times working together. And uh, I think a, a success for the book that was the, uh, beyond our imagining that we, we started it, even though we imagined much better than than uh, freedom could. So <clears throat> I would just uh, add, uh, in addition to thanks for all that you put together, and thanks for the years we've had together in connection with that book and the rest of physics. Uh, I would mention one thing about uh, the uh, book. Uh, it's often, there's often a question of the boxes and all that sort of thing. And one of the reasons for that was that if we were trying to think about what's the best way to present something, there would be frequent differences. And turning those out would have taken time. So we just put one new point in the text and the other point in a box and moved on. So we figured that it would take us twice as long to write the book if we tried to do it uh, 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 with the uh, just one presentation of each of uh, the publishing topics, extending just through everything to, to the reader and they could take their choices. So that was uh, a way of avoiding spending more time. <coughs> the same thing, question came up when we asked whether we could have a revised edition. And we said, no, uh, it would, uh, be totally impossible to to make a revised edition without doubling the size of the book, and uh, it would also uh, go against the publisher's demand that as we brought it up to date ten years after publication, we should, uh, in addition to bringing it up to date, we should also cut the size in half. So neither of those was attractive to us, and so it stayed untouched until uh, Macmillan lost understanding of what they had in their hands. So that was some great stuff. So that's uh, one of the things is uh, that uh, uh, in addition to the two tracks, track one and track two, which got straight up together, I've often, I found certainly after get, uh, getting the book to teaching courses, uh, I found that there's there's a third, it's something I call a half track. And I think it's been adopted also, or embedded. So the team of three by, for instance, uh, 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 30, 30 ships and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 which is, the, Uh, Einstein had great difficulty with the mathematics when he attacked gravitation. Uh, he had to think in mechanical terms. He very easily found out that, that by letting the velocity of light be dependent on the gravitational potential, he could explain things like the density of light and the uh, redshift and whatnot. So uh, the, it took a long time for him to get the equations right. Well, the students find the same things. So the half track says, explain what that, explain to the students that although uh, Einstein moved to where he thought he needed to make use of a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a 10, Ten, uh, a gravitational potential of 10 pieces. The uh, 
he uh, he, uh, he skipped ahead uh, and uh, eventually with help got the math straight. But the students, I think, have the same difficulty. So you just tell them, well, Einstein had uh, knew he had to have a, a, a uh, metric tensor uh, to describe gravity, but he didn't know how to handle it. It took him years to get it straight. And the same is true for students. So the way you teach the course is you explain that uh, Einstein knew he needed geometry and a metric tensor, uh, but uh, it was difficult. So the way the students should be taught it is to say, well, we're just going to skip over the mathematical difficulties. And before we explain all the things about historical symbols and curvatures and so forth, we will simply go to the applications of the metric to describe it. So you, you skip all that hard mathematics and say, now, once Einstein solved the problem, we had the, the Schwarzschild solution, the solution for the metric of space time around the star. And we can show you how that works. And then we also show you how to think about cosmology using a metric that depends on time. And uh, uh, those were also solutions of the Einstein equations. So before we give you the Einstein equations, which are so difficult, we're going to take the, the best solutions of those equations and explain how they apply to physics. It's not you think about black holes or cosmology or this, that, and the other thing. And only after the students are motivated by seeing that this geometry gets you somewhere, do you go back and put them to the ground and actually understanding all the mathematics. So that's, a, that's my half track. We, we skip several of the track one chapters with only minor motivation and say, let's look at the solutions of the equation, even though we don't know how to get them yet. So that's a change in the use of the book that I found very attractive. And I can say uh, other uh, people have also brought that there. Uh, of course, another thing we should be thankful for is the good students we had at those times. Because as you point out, there were a lot of faculty in many institutions who didn't think we should be spending time on gravity. And yet we were able to attract uh, very clever and uh, eager students with a lot to help us with. So it's a fact that the young, the young kids in graduate school were ahead of the faculty on learning what uh, gravity can do for us. So that uh, it was a really great pleasure for each of us to have found wonderful students to work with and help us develop the book. So, uh, and thank you all for uh, having this celebration. I'm so uh, delighted. I get so much joy from thinking about the book that I'm glad to share that with our audience here and with you today. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Thank you all. This was wonderful. Um, there are several questions, but before I turn to the questions, I would like to read out some of the comments that were made during Kip's talk. For example, Sharon Morsing pointed out that the long list of errata that you showed looks like uh, Israel's handwriting. <laughs> was it true? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, it could very, very, very well have been. Um, it it uh, that I I went into the dungeon underneath my garage and in my house, and I dug these things out, and I quickly photographed them just before I got on the plane to come up to Oregon, where where I am at the moment. So I been sitting back back in Pasadena. I'll dig it out and look to see Sharon, <laughs> but it could very, very well have been. Um, there's also some comments from people you know very well. Carton Cave says, proofreading Kip's chapters in the summer of 1972, which meant reading the whole book, was the formative experience of my scientific life. <laughs> <laughs> and then Neil Cummings said, I graded the GR course for Charlie the first year the printed edition came out. 
and Beverly Berger says, I graded the 1968 course while I was taking it. Uh, William Press said, when I was an assistant professor in Princeton working for John Wheeler, this was while you were talking about the differences between Wheeler and Chandra. We had him and Chandra for dinner, turned into the most wonderful needling match. Wish could have been recorded. Would you like to say something about it? Bill, are you still around? I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm here if you can hear me. Um, well, Ch Chandra and Wheeler simply hated each other, but uh, they expressed that hatred in the most um, respectful, professional tones that that if you hadn't known it, you just wouldn't have ever picked up on it, but, but it was really there. Thank you. Um, then I can turn to the actual questions. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna forget some of them, but I'll try. Uh, Tejinder Singh says, uh, is it not what Feynman thought of the book? And did you all make the problem sets? <laughs> so, I, no, I don't know that I ever discussed the book with Feynman. Um, uh, I don't recall. Um, my guess is that uh, he rather liked it. Uh, he, but uh, and he, uh, but no, I never. I don't think I ever discussed it directly with him. What was the other question? Yes, yes. Uh, the other question was: Did you all make the problem sets? Uh, we each wrote uh, a large, a significant fraction of the problems. We made an agreement right almost from the beginning that the problems would be interspersed throughout the chapters, that the problems would be a very important part of the actual reading of the chapters. And, and the crafting of the problem was tremendously important to us. And uh, the process of uh, debugging the problems was very important. And it was uh, also a part of the job of uh, Carlton Caves and the other students who helped us to, to debug the problems uh, with us. Um, so, yeah. There's another question. And, 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 and in many cases, uh, uh, the problems were created uh, through this iterative process. Somebody would write a problem, it would be uh, revised by one of us and then another and then another, and they, they were massaged along with the text. Thanks. A question from Paul Halpern and taking them in order. I read somewhere that Kurt Gödel took interest in the book and was interested in his presentation of rotating cosmologies. Do you have a recollection of that? Well, the recollection that we have is, is simply that when we were writing the book um, uh, and we were at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, Johnny uh, took Charlie and me down to meet Kurt Gödel and uh, uh, and Gödel, uh, it's the only time I ever met him, but uh, he focused in very quickly on the issue of uh, the of uh, whether or not there is a net, if, if you average over the uh, motions of the galaxies, whether there's a net rotation uh, in various regions of the, of the universe, whether galaxies align at all. And uh, Johnny writes about this, I think, in his uh, and his autobiography uh, book, uh, Gion's, uh, I forget the name. Black the name holes of the and book. quantum foam. Yeah, yeah, Gion's black holes and quantum foam. He describes uh, then this interaction with Gödel. He was really interested in this, of course, because of his model universe in which uh, there are closed time-like curves that arise uh, as a result of uh, a combination of a cosmological constant and net rotation. Um, and I think it is also in John's autobiography, or maybe it's elsewhere, that John describes, uh, I think, uh, a, a Kurt Gödel being very interested in the uh, in the data when Jim Peebles had data that showed that, uh, in fact, uh, there was basically no net rotation. Uh, and Gödel was just tremendously interested in those data. Thank you so much. 
Shantung Desai asks, were the MTW authors aware that Weinberg was also writing a book on GR and vice versa? And uh, were the MTW authors aware of Weinberg's non-geometric take on the book while it was being written? I don't recall how much we were aware of Weinberg's book while it was being written. We were certainly very much aware of it when it came out. Um, and, uh, I, and I have thought about the two books a lot in the decades since then. Um, in my own book, Black Holes and Time Warps, I have a chapter on what is reality in which I talk about how you can regard general relativity as a field theory or in, from the point of view of geometry, and that there are, in fact, situations, there have been in my own research, where it was much more powerful to take the field theory point of view uh, and others where it was much more powerful to take the geometry point of view. And so I appreciate both. And uh, I appreciate having these two uh, textbooks from that same era that take the two different approaches. Uh, I think it's it's been of great value to the community to have the two approaches out there in a powerful textbook form from right that same beginning of that era. Thanks. One more question from Giulio Serbenta. How did the process of making the figures look like? In the final version, were they just photocopies or hand drawings, or did you use any computer graphics? How intense was the interaction between you and the publishers to achieve the best appearance? Uh, there were no computer graphics in that era. Uh, they uh, And they were not just photographs of, of the original uh, drawings. Uh, so Robert Ishikawa, the publishers, was in charge of converting our figures into uh, into uh, beautifully drafted figures. They were drafted by draftsmen and draftswomen. I don't know. Well, I think they were probably may have been sent out uh, to be done outside of the publisher. That was common in those days. Um, and, but because the figures were so meticulously drawn, it was not a very difficult job for it, it but it was kind of time consuming. And so the redrawing of the figures began, uh, I think, if my memory is right, before we had even uh, submitted the final manuscript for publication. They were already working some months earlier on redrawing the figures. Thank you. Uh, I'll read out some comments from the chat. Tavi Andre says, Kip, your comments about Berkeley Street people in the early 70s carrying copies reminded me that my copy was purchased in the Berkeley bookstore where it was prominent, prominently displayed just after that period in late 1976 or early 1977. I also heard similar comments from Julian Krolik here that they were, they were on display uh, to attract people to the bookstore. <laughs> um, Davidson Joseph says, uh, one of the most lucrative things that drew me into MTW was the beautiful and bizarre illustrations of differential forms. One forms corresponding to piercing these hypersurfaces, two forms as oriented honeycomb-like structures, etc. I wanted to ask how that process was like, and adding on to that, what books were served as inspiration for what, what books served as inspiration for this? I think Charlie may be able to answer that. I, I know that the idea of drawing forms in this way did, did not originate with us. So I think among us it may have come from Johnny. Certainly the bongs to the bell came from Johnny, not from Charlie or me. Um, but uh, but uh, this precedes us, but I have forgotten from where. Charlie, do you, can you tell us? Well, I don't know. One of the things I brought in, which I learned from the French book by Ishmael, was that there is a fundamental difference between a contravariant and a covariant tensor. To, to, whereas, Previously, people just treated that as a, as a, as a convenience of uh, computation rather than having any serious uh, insight. But uh, the mathematicians started, starting with uh, uh, the French strong, strong mathematics at that time and developed the ideas of, of uh, the body in space. And these two uh, differences are very important because 
it turns out that if you're looking for a light bulb, you really have to sketch it in your mind as a contravariant of tensor or tangent to a, to a line. It doesn't help to have it look like the, uh, uh, look, look, look like the uh, uh, maps you get of, of, uh, uh, of uh, mountains and things that just have the various levels marked. So there's a big difference there. And uh, that sort of insight into the math of, of the geometrical meaning of the math uh, was grew up within the mathematical community. At the time we were writing, the French were about the strongest in mathematics. And uh, John always loved that. And so he was, he had me look at the uh, Schneider's book uh, as well as other people teaching me things like that. So there was a lot of, of uh, deeper understanding of the geometry, of Riemannian geometry uh, that uh, was come, came through me to the, to the group of the three of us and so on. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark Favada says, how did the experience of writing in TW influence your writing? It's addressed to Cape, I guess, some modern classical physics. <laughs> well, writing MTW uh, really impacted me greatly in terms of adopting a geometric approach to physics. And in, in modern classical physics with Roger Blanford, Roger happily embraced this as well. And so we really basically took over the entire uh, geometrical approach for, for doing basically all of physics in, the, the, uh, uh, in, in our book. Um, the style of our book is very much like uh, MTW, not nearly as much flair as because we no longer had Johnny with us, but uh, it, uh, we have boxes, we have marginal comments, we have uh, basically all the same gimmicks. Um, and so, yes, it, it had a huge impact on me. It, uh, and uh, and uh, I was very pleased that Roger Blanford uh, embraced it as well then. There is a variation of the Weinberg question. Do you know what Weinberg thought of MTW? No, I never discussed it with him. I, I would presume Richard Matzner might know, but if Richard's here. I don't know if he is. No. Um, I am here, but I never discussed that with Johnny. Amazing. OK, thank, I'm, I'm amazed at the crowd that gathered for this. It's, it's great. Um, William Bang Lomholt to Charlie, I am very impressed with all the work and love that John Kip and you put into this, pure inspiration. All the best love here from your great nephew in Denmark. Um, Veronica Hubeni says, with modern technology, the ease of collaboration, typesetting, etc., it would, of course, be far more straightforward. But I wonder if you feel that there will be a crucial part of the process missed, possibly to any sort of detriment of the final product. Um, I think uh, I. Uh, I've not thought about this at all, but it just occurs to me that the process of writing together, and, and I showed you the cutting and the pasting and the, the personal interactions, uh, had played a big role, I think, in our uh, development of our viewpoint on the book and on science. Um, I don't know whether in the modern era, doing things on computers, uh, as we would otherwise have done, and probably from a distance. I don't know that, well, I'm, I'm sure it would not have been as much fun. Uh, uh, and, I, and I'm not sure we would have come up with as good a product, but uh, that's just a guess. Maybe maybe it's just a, 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 a fairy tale guess, but it's a guess. From Philip Stamp. How much were you influenced by Landau and Lifshitz? And uh, what 
did Lifshitz and Zeldovich think of MTW? <laughs> uh, I personally, I was very strongly influenced by classical theory of fields. It was the place that I, uh, I went to learn relativity first before I ever uh, uh, went anywhere else. Um, and I was, however, I was also influenced by uh, the uh, problems of the terseness of Landau and Lifshitz. Lifshitz really insisted that things be terse, be crystal clear and terse, but you can't be crystal clear and terse both. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the discussion basically of, of radiation reaction uh, in Landau and Lifshitz, uh, <clears throat> I think if you read between the lines and you go back to the Russian edition and not just the English edition, uh, I seem to see there uh, something that's much deeper and much more solid than most people have seen. Uh, but you have to read between the lines. You have, uh, it's, it's, it's not obvious on the surface at all. Uh, so Landau and Lifshitz, I got a negative uh, uh, reaction to it in terms of the terseness, uh, but uh, very positive in, in terms of uh, the ideas that were in there, the, the physics that was in there. I think it was really quite remarkable what, what they had and the insights that they had in there. Uh, I have a question from Ted Jacobson. He says- well, let, 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 me, let me just oh, okay. tell one anecdote. So, so the, there were the Stevens relativity meetings that uh, uh, we would, went to in the era when I was a graduate student uh, that uh, at the Stevens Institute of Technology. And uh, I, at the Stevens meeting, there was a story told that just before my time, whether it was apocryphal or not, I don't know, that somebody got up at a Stevens meeting and talked about some subject and some person in the back of the room stood up uh, uh, right after and said, that's in land uh, classical theory of fields. And this happened again and again. And then John Wheeler got up and talked about geons. And uh, this guy stood up and said, that's not in land uh, But it, it, it certainly was a highly respected book, but it certainly did not have uh, the new things that uh, Johnny was thinking about in that era. Right. So Ted was asking, um, do you have any stories about the final chapter, Frontiers? So much of that inspired me so much as a student. So the final chapter is obviously Wheeler. Uh, in fact, the, the final part, part 10 of the book, is, uh, is uh, primarily Wheeler. I think uh, Charlie had some significant impact in there, but the final chapter is obviously Wheeler. I think it's a, a remarkable chapter, but I can cl claim it's, it's the one chapter that I did not participate in uh, in revisions of. It was uh, it was just uh, it was in some sense too personal. Uh, it was personal wheeler, and it, it wasn't something that I felt I had any right to to manipulate uh, the prose on. Um, there are lots of comments of praise. Hank Van Elst says, thank you to MTW for a timeless piece of art and an everlasting intellectual inspiration. Um, Shantanu Desai says, uh, David Kaiser has written a lot about the disconnect between particle physicists and GR in the 50s and 60s. Did this book influence particle physicists and string theorists into working on GR-related topics? I don't know. Um, it, uh, certainly there are people who became part of this string theorists who uh, got courses out of this book. Um, but uh, how much impact the book itself had in, in, in drawing them in, I don't know. Uh, Bernard Carr. When I began my PhD with Stephen Hawking in 1972, the first task he assigned me was to read MTW, then in preliminary form, and do all the exercises. It was a wonderful way to start my career. Um, How long did it take? <laughs> Reading and doing exercises must, must have been many, many months. 
Bernard, are you around? I don't know if he's still here. Uh, yes, indeed. Oh, it, it took a long time, but it was uh, well worth it. it. I think I spent the whole of the first year kept reading it. <laughs> I, I think I've still got those blue versions of MTW in my, in my library. So it's very nostalgic every time I touch, touch the book. <laughs> For me, too. <laughs> Navneet Mishra, uh, if you go back in time to when you were first writing Gravitation, what advice would you give your younger self about the process of writing? Thank you for this amazing and inspiring talk. <laughs> Boy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, I think I, I would have told told myself to get going earlier quicker and as i indicated we were very slow getting started a lot a lot of discussion but not much action until the summer of 69 and uh but uh beyond that well maybe the other the other thing is uh, it wouldn't have hurt if we had delayed getting the book out one more year because there was uh, in that what, one more year, there was Hawking radiation uh, and uh, the uh, beginnings of the connections uh, to, uh, to, quant to quantum physics uh, that uh, were not quite coming out yet. The Bekenstein was in that next year and so forth. So although it was in a near optimal time to write because most of the, almost the, the bulk of the major classical work that was done in that golden age was in hand uh, there was some that was not in in the some very important stuff in the connection to quantum theory was not so i sort of wish in retrospect we had delayed publish publishing for one more year it's hard to make predictions about the future uh, <laughs> leo stein reminds me that i skipped over one question so i'm, I'm gonna ask it again it was from shantanu uh, he, he was asking is there any topic on which draft chapters material was written but does not appear in the final form in mtw i don't know i would have to go back and look my my memory is not clear enough it's not um i th i think there were probably there certainly was material that did not get into the final book but not a large amount uh there was stuff that it, but there was were also points of view that got discarded along the way and replaced by better points of view uh, uh but uh i think it it would be interesting to go back and and look at the, these kinds of questions, uh, but uh, I don't remember. Okay, Michael Maroon says, when I was a student at the University of Texas just before the turn of the millennium, I had to take the senior graduate GR course as a sophomore because it was only offered every four years. Among the students, there was great concern that Steven Weinberg would teach the course because his book was more expensive. Fortunately, <laughs> Richard Masner taught it and used Bernard Schultz's book, both in attendance here, as an atlas for MTW. Is it still true that MTW is less expensive than Steve's hardcover book? Also, if there is time, how did the two of you, Kip and Charlie, uh, feel about the poetry toward the end of the book? So the poetry toward the end of the book, uh... I mean, I quite like it. It's again vintage Wheeler. There's there's two pages, two facing pages of poetry and an elaborate uh, uh, a picture of an angel with a trumpet uh, and uh, farewell words to uh, the reader and signatures of John, Charlie, and me. Obviously, this was written by John. Uh, I, I think Charlie and I both had great affection for John and great respect for is uh, uh, for his style. Yes, we did tone it down from time to time, as I as I indicated. But uh, I was perfectly comfortable with with this. Quite happy to have it included. And I don't think I 
uh, did any editing on it at all. I suspect Charlie didn't either. I would say the same thing. Okay. Out of respect for John, the admiration of it, and Dr. Eddie interfered with his last uh, poetry. Thank you both. Uh, there's a comment from Veronica Hubeni who says, definitely, in response to whether MTW influenced string theorists. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then Tevi Andre says, I read most of MTW as part of a reading course with Ray Sachs. Most of the answers are penciled into my copy of MTW. Shantanu Desai says... Let me just say, I, I take that as a great compliment if Ray Sachs had a student uh, reading out of MTW because uh, Sachs was one of the giants in, in, in my mind. And uh, what I learned about uh, gravitational wave theory from him very early on was uh, so powerful. Can I jump in with a comment quickly? Yeah. So I was a student of Ray's, and I, the first thing I asked him was, I see that there's a relativity course in the mathematics department and the physics department, which do you recommend? And he said, it doesn't really matter, I teach them both. Um, <laughs> but he taught the physics course out of MTW, which I was not able to take, and he taught the math course out of his own book, which was just published at that time. Interesting. Um. There's more questions that keep coming. Um, from Sadeg Moslehi, uh, recently I had this chance to take an offer from a publisher to publish my thesis into a book. Uh, I'm not an expert. I would like to ask you, who are, uh, who are so expert and experienced, how do I create interesting chapters? <laughs> Is it to write as a story with pictures and deep calculations or just write logically? <laughs> well, I think so. So I, I, I think it's it, one piece of advice is that uh, scientific writing is very different than uh, non scientific writing. Uh, you can still write, do scientific writing with flair and with pictures and so forth, but uh, uh, but uh, it's important to recognize the difference to, to to make things clear you need a lot of parallel structure and sentences for example which uh, makes it very turgid in non-scientific writing uh, but uh, i certainly am an advocate of figures uh, of as uh, and uh, figures parables uh, analogies as powerful tools for communicating ideas and uh, as things that do make the right make a book much more interesting. Mark Favata says, perhaps this is widely known, but I read somewhere that NTW was a big inspiration for a detailed and beautifully produced multi-volume cookbook. <laughs> Modernist Cuisine by Nathan Mervold. Uh, I think Nathan may have told me this at, at, at one point. Nathan very kindly gave me a, cop a copy of this multi-volume uh, book. It's uh, about that thick uh, when you stack the volumes together. And absolutely gorgeous photographs. And uh, he also has one on pizza. That, uh, so uh, the, the, these these are really gorgeous books and yeah i think i gather that uh, mtw was some influence on him modernist cuisine okay um there's more and more uh, uh shantanu says i have heard Feynman also taught a course in gr at caltech and that notes from that course were published by caltech press is it true and if so were you also influenced by those notes yeah, so uh, Feynman taught a course in <clears throat> in 1963 while I was, well, he, he taught twice, once in 1963 while I was at Princeton as a graduate student. Uh, and But I was involved, John Preskill and I were involved uh, some years later in helping arrange that this get, got uh, published as a regular book. Uh, the notes were taken by... Uh, Fernando Morenigo and I've forgotten who, but several different people. 
uh, I took notes in this course, and it was basically a course where he built, where at least in part, he built up general relativity, uh, uh, beginning with the linear theory and uh, then building up step by step to get to the nonlinear general relativity. Um, but he was writing this at the same, the period not long after he had uh, struggled with uh, developing a Feynman diagram uh, approach to quantum gravity and uh, uh, a few years after that. And it was also the period of the discovery of quasars and so forth. And Jim Bardeen was his graduate student at the time uh, and uh, worked with John and, and with uh, Willie Fowler on uh, things like relativistic stars. Feynman was very broad. Um, and so anyway, this, this book is available. It's uh, called the Feynman Lectures on Gravitation, I think. Um, and yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, Senovi just says, I know a relativist that used MTW, its weight and the gravitational field to eliminate little annoying mice. There are several uses of the book, but this is one I have never heard of. Um, Tejinder Singh says, the book by Hawking and Ellis also came out in 1973. Do you recall how it was uh, received in comparison to MTW and Weinberg? Well, cer certainly. I mean, I was very enthusiastic about Hawking and Ellis. And uh, I, the, uh, and I, <laughs> My copy of Hawking and Ellis is about as marked up as any book that I own. Um, I think it was very, very positively re received. Um, mm. And uh, Weinberg's book, uh, although, as I've said, although it was uh, very different from our approach, it also was very important to me for this different approach that it took. And I think all three books were were very well received. I don't think you didn't ha you didn't have the controversy swirling around the others that you had around MTW, uh, but uh, I, but I think they all three rather quickly were embraced by the community. Let me add that the idea was to have this celebration of MTW as the first of a series, and these other books that we've been mentioning a lot are other books that we've been thinking about, of course. Um, uh, Carton Cave says, MTW is a chapter on the Cartan curvature of formalism. Where did that come from? And was it seen as anything more than mathematical convenience? So uh, I don't know where it originally originates, but I know that, uh, at least as I recall, it was Andrei Troutman in, uh, in Poland who called Wheeler's attention to it. Uh, and uh, it, I, it may have originated with with Troutman, but I'm not sure. We'd have to go. Charlie would know. Uh, I, and I think it's it's more than I think it's very important for its big illustration of uh, the uh, that you can geometrize a theory like Newton's theory in a beautiful way. Uh, and that ties into modern differential geometry. And uh, it had a big impact on me in the sense that uh, of coming to appreciate uh, uh, physics as geometry. Uh, and I, uh, and later on when Carlton Caves and others were working on uh, post-Newtonian approximation and ex experimental tests, it, it became a, a uh, a beautiful example of prior uh, theory with prior geometry in it. Uh, and uh, so, no, I, I think for me, it, it, it was a major part of my sort of intellectual heritage uh, from, uh, from Mr. Wheeler Troutman and so forth. Charlie, would you like to say something more about this? Maybe, no? Okay. Um, one more question from Nauman Ibrahim. How proud are you to have MTW as an accomplishment? 
compared to other things you two have accomplished over your <laughs> career, of which there are a few. <laughs> it, it certainly is up there. It's one of, one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, and uh, I think the thing I'm most proud of is, is my students and the, uh, the things that my students have done. I think MTW then comes in second, probably along with several other things. But it uh, also is full of just absolutely marvelous memories of my friendship with Charlie and John and uh, and uh, the whole process and, and uh, the feeling of deep satisfaction when it came out, the uh, pleasure I took in the mixed reviews that it got that, that uh, I think it would have been a failure if it had been universally accepted. Uh, I th think the, uh, well, uh, enough. Charlie, what about you? Would you like to say something about this? Oh, certainly. Uh, I'll say, uh, seeing you work on that, that great reception that you see, but I got trying to give a report card on everything I've thought about or done. So I just say this is one of the top marks of my life. And if you're a part of this, we're very happy about it. Um. We're almost at the end. Uh, Bernard Schultz says, uh, sorry, I had to go. Thank you, Kate and Charlie. It was great to see you and to remember watching the book grow while I was learning the subject myself. By the way, I love Mirbold's five volume bread books, which I now had to look up myself, I guess. Um, <laughs> Dimitris Papadopoulos, hi Dimitris, by the way, uh, haven't seen you in a long time. He says, thanks Kate and David. Well done to the organizers, thank you. Uh, uh, Scott Hughes says, a lot of our students, at least post-1973, well, were pulled into the subject and into your orbit, in part because the textbook was so intriguing, and I'm one of them. Uh, thank you so much for everything. Also, Scott was pointing out in the chat to me that one of the important dates for MTW is September 14. 1973, which happens to uh, just so happens to be exactly 42 years, as we know, 42 is a very important number before the discovery of gravitational waves. <laughs> so I don't know if you ever thought about it. I certainly didn't. <laughs> no. Um, okay. Um, there are thank you messages. Um, Ingrid Ger Nerlich, I'm going to read this one. Where there, there's a message that says MTW is about lasting friendship, which I think is wonderful, and I want to read it out. Ingrid Gnerlich says, Thank you so much for this wonderful event, presentations, and all the fascinating questions. Having worked with Kip and Charlie on Gravitation's publication at Princeton University Press, it has been an honor to play a small part in the phenomenal history of this book and in giving it a new publishing home. We absolutely treasure the book and the true pleasure of working with Kip and Charlie. And it is remarkable what they have done with this at Princeton University Press. And I mean, it's, uh, we've, we've been so happy with them. I think we can wrap it up here. I, I am so thankful to the <laughs> two of you and David. Uh, for agreeing to to do this. I, I think I learned a lot from, from the event. Thank you for allowing me to record it. We're gonna put it on YouTube for all of the many people who could not attend because we hit the threshold of 300 people on Zoom and many people just couldn't come in even if, if they had time to do it. Um, well, thank you very much for putting this together. It's very dedicated. We had this occasion where some of my family could look in and see what I've been up to in these many years. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I, yes, I thank I you, Emmanuel. Thank you. I, I wouldn't be doing gravity if it were not for you guys. So I think I should thank you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thanks again. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to upload this to YouTube for the many people who wanted to attend and couldn't. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.